So, yeah, we're just going to look at um, the power of having a good name, um, the power of having integrity. And um, what we're going to do, we're just going to go through some scriptures. It will be a Bible study, I think, tonight. So let us go to, um, let us go to actually Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. Okay, I'll give you a minute. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. It says, Then Paul came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by, by them, by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So he's talking about Timothy here and how basically uh, Timothy had a good reputation from all of the disciples that were in um in there. Yeah, so um another scripture actually that just reinforces this concept. If you go to Proverbs chapter 22, verses one, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and long loving favor rather than silver and gold. I'll read it again. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Okay, I'm of the persuasion that we get a good name when we do good to people. Okay, and this is what character is about. Character is about doing good to other people C character is about what do people say about you do people have positive things to say about you because when we look at christ in the case of christ they had positive things to say about christ at the end when they when they uh, persecuted him and crucified him the only people that rose up against him were people that wanted him dead for religious reasons that wanted him dead for political reasons and at the end of the day, what did they what did they do? They couldn't say anything evil about him. They couldn't they couldn't find a single fault in his character. So they had to make up lies to destroy him. Look, we know that we've arrived. We know we've arrived. Sorry. Just if you bear with me. Just need to. Sorry. Yeah, we know that we've arrived uh, to the character that God wants us to possess when there are, there are, there's, you know, when nobody can really say anything evil of us unless they come up with a lie. Okay. Let's look at the example. Let's look at two examples really quickly. I was talking about Jesus, but let me show you what Peter said about Jesus and his ministry. If you just come with me to Acts chapter 10. Greetings, brother Adam. Hello, brother. We're just talking about character today. So Acts chapter 10, verses um, verses 38. <clears throat> it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So, Jesus, it says, Jesus went about doing good. So Jesus had a good, a good reputation. Jesus had a good character. And incidentally, I think this passage is talking about the two roles that the Holy Ghost has. So when we become saved, God anoints us. God gives us a measure of the Holy Ghost and he anoints us. That, that term anoint means to smear. Okay, it means to saturate. God smears us with his spirit. And that anointing is given to us for two specific purposes. And, and it's outlined here in this verse. The first purpose is for power. Okay. It's for power. When, when you're anointed with the Holy Ghost, you should be able to do miracles. Jesus said in Mark 16, these signs shall follow, follow those that believe. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall cast out devils. They, they, uh, they will drink a, poisoned, a poisonous thing and it shall not harm them. They shall raise the dead. They shall cleanse the lepers. He said, these signs will follow those that believe. That, why, how is that all possible? 
through the anointing of the Holy Ghost? How is it possible that Samson could kill, Samson could kill a lion? How is it possible that Samson could kill a thousand men with a bone because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost? How is it possible that, that Christ could go to a tomb and a man had been dead for four days and he can say to Lazarus, without even touching him, he can say, Lazarus, arise. And after four days, Lazarus is, is, is raised from the dead because of the anointing. So the, fir the first purpose of the anointing is to have supernatural power, to do wonders, to do signs, to do miracles, to also operate in your gift, to operate in your calling. If you're called to be a prophet, to prophesy and to, to, to identify word of knowledge, etc., that comes from an anointing uh, to teach, to even teach the word of God that you need an anointing to do that, to evangelize and to win souls, to heal the sick, you need an anointing. So the first purpose, again, for the anointing is... Uh, to manifest the power of God. But the second uh, reason to have the anointing is, is more powerful, I believe, or equally as powerful. And that second purpose for the anointing is to develop your character, okay? Because we see here, if I read it again, Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power who went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So, so Christ needed anointing to heal those that were oppressed of the devil, but he also needed the anointing to, to do good. To be a good person, you need the anointing. To be a good person, you need the Holy Spirit. And that is the sole purpose, or not the sole, but that is the main purpose of the Holy Spirit inside of us. In numerous passages in the Bible, it talks about how there is nobody that is good except God. There was a man that came to Christ and he said, good master, what can I do to inherit salvation? And Christ said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. So even Christ conceded that goodness comes from God. So that means character, developing a good character, that also comes from God. And this, this concept of character is not something that we're born with. This, uh, this nature of character is something that is developed in through us by the Holy Ghost over a, a long period of time. It's not something that takes place over a year or 10 years. It's something that will happen until the day that we die. God is always working on the inside of us, trying to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ. You think of somebody like Moses. Moses had a fairly good character. You know, it talks about how, um, you know, Moses was the meekest man. He was the, the most humble man on the earth. And yet there were things in his character that he still hadn't eradicated, bad things in his character he still hadn't dealt with. He was, he was quite an angry man, actually. Sometimes he was angry, sometimes he lost his temper. God told him, speak to the rock. In his wrath, in his anger, he smote the rock. And God told him, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I think in that message, God is trying to teach us that there are certain things in our character that if we don't deal with, we might not be able to enter into the kingdom. Moses could not enter into the kingdom because of that issue. So when we look at character, it's something that, um, that we need to develop. And it's something that, as much as we believe in Christ, we need to let that belief mold our character into, into, into better people. And as I said before, the, the way in which we're going to be able to identify uh, if our character is good is when people cannot say anything against us. People have no accusations against us. And that is what happened in the life of Christ. In the life of Christ, when they took him to Pontius Pilate and they took him to Herod to, to question him. Uh, the people said, oh, you know, Herod and, and Pontius Pilate said, there's no reason why this guy should be here. Like he hasn't done anything wrong, he's without blame. And the only way that they could get Christ was by getting people to lie about him, to slander him. And um, that is when we know when we've arrived in terms of character. The same thing happened to Joseph. If you come with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 39, we'll read from verses one. Genesis chapter 39 from verse 1 <clears throat> says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of Ish brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. Okay, so we see the key towards Joseph's good character. It's the fact that God was with him. Okay, remember the Bible says the fruit 
of the spirit is love, joy, temperance, meekness, humility, long suffering. The, the fruit of the spirit is, is good character. Is good character, but good character, that fruit of the spirit comes when, it comes only when God is with you. Anybody that is in the world that appears to have a good character and does not have God does not have a good character. Because the Bible says that our own righteousness is as filthy rags. So there's some people in the world, they may seem like they're humble, and I'm sure they are humble to some degree. It may seem like they're kind, and I'm sure they are kind to some degree. But when compared to the kindness and the humility and the love of God, you, you can't really compare it. And this is the whole point of grace. Grace teaches us that we are not good by our own works. We cannot become humble by ourselves. We cannot become loving by ourselves. We need that intimate walk with Jesus in order to gain all of those positive attributes that are in God. When we look at somebody who is good, it is coming from God. So we need him in our lives. And this was the key to Joseph's success, not only with regards to his character, but with regards to promotion, with regards to wealth, with regards to favor, with regards to him fulfilling his destiny, his call, the call of God for his life. It all came from the fact that he was intimate with God. And for me, how do we become intimate with God? We come, become intimate with God through being in his word, speaking about his word regularly. Remember, the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was God. The word was God and the word was with God. So God, as the, as the scripture said, has esteemed his word higher than everything else. The Lord has esteemed his word highly. So the way in which to, to get close to the Lord, as the Lord told uh, Joshua, is to ensure that the word does not depart from your mouth. Okay, that you meditate on the word day in and day out. For in the evening, in the morning, in the afternoon. And he told Joshua, if you do so, then you will have great success. You will be prosperous in everything that you do. So that is the way we get close to the Lord, by meditating on the word of God, by speaking the word of God regularly. And that's why it's so important that we're selective with the relationships we have, because you, we can achieve so much in a, in a short period of time if we but have people around us that are surrounding themselves in the word of God. If we, if we spend all of our time with people who spoke about the word of God and we spoke about it as well, all the time, we will grow so much in the space of one year. And that's why this world is built in such a way that you hardly hear of the word of God. It, it gets, you know, for me, when I hear somebody quoting the Bible, a politician, I'm hearing it a bit more now, some members of parliament quoting the scriptures. But when I hear it, I, I get shocked. I get completely shocked because you can see that Satan has strategic, strategically eradicated the word of God from every area of our society because Satan knows there is power in the word of God. And that's why he even tried to use the power of the word of God against Christ. Because he knows that there's power in the word of God. Um, so there's that way, meditating on the word of God, speaking the word of God regularly. Uh, but also seeking God, you know, thinking about God, thinking about him, thinking about how your, the decisions you make in life, how would God respond to those decisions? What is God's perspective? What is God's opinion on the decisions that you make? When God sees that, God is, is going to dwell with you. God is going to be close to you. Because God said that when we draw near to him, that he will draw near to us. So how does God know when we draw near to him? It's an internal state. It's about your heart. It's your heart condition. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the fear of the Lord is in your heart. It's in your heart. And when God sees that, God draws himself closely to you. God, that's why there's some people, they fast, they pray, they do everything. But God is far from them. And then there's, a, there's somebody that all they do is just fear God and keep his commandments. And God is so close. They don't tithe. They don't fast for long periods of time. Some of them don't even go to church. But they fear God in their heart. They keep his commandments. And the power, the power and the presence of God is with them wherever they go. And that is why Jesus said that there's some of you, you draw near with your mouths, you worship with your mouths, but your heart is far from him. And Jesus gave the disciples an example where there were these men that they gave 
thousands of thousands of pounds. And there was this woman and she gave a little penny. And God said, which, what, you know, which one gave the most? And, the, the, and Christ said, it's the woman that gave that little. That little she gave more out of the abundance that she had. Out of the abundance that they had, they gave what they, what they gave. But she gave everything she had. Look, when we give God everything we have, what, what is everything we have? Everything we have is not just our money. Everything we have is our mind, is our heart, is our soul, is our might. The Bible didn't say love God with all of your money. The Bible says love God with all of your might. Your, that means your energy. Love God with all of your soul. That means all of your affection, your, your emotions, your attention, your mind is focused on God. You're literally walking with God every single step that you take in life, you have God in your heart, you're thinking about him, you're, you're fearing him. When you have that, and, and I believe this is what Joseph had, then we all can become incredibly intimate with God. Remember, this is, not by, this is not by our own strength, the Bible says, it's not by our own might, but it's by the spirit. And the spirit is God. The spirit is God. And this God wants to be intimate with us, but this God knows that we can only be intimate with him when we fear him and keep his commandments. Amen. So let's look back at the life of Joseph. It says, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he, he did to prosper in his hand. Okay, so when the glory of God is with you, nobody can deny it. Amen. Nobody can deny when God is with you. You see, the reason why there are atheists in the world today is because the children of God are not rising up to what they've been called to do. God has not called us to, to deal with atheists and to try and convince them that Jesus Christ is Lord. God has called us to, 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 to glorify him. Okay, what I want us to do, because I want to just uh, pinpoint this position. We're going to come back to Genesis 39 and look at Joseph. But I want to show us two scriptures quickly, which show us that when we glorify God, that people will come to Christ. Okay, it's only a matter of time. In Isaiah chapter 60, let's quickly read Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, <clears throat> from verses 1, it says, Arise and shine, for the light for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Okay, so we think when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to soul winning, we think that the most effective way is to stand on a street corner, and to shout, repent, or you go to hell. We think that the most effective way to bring people to Christ is to get a track with our number and to hand them out and to stand there for hours. To then find out later that maybe one person, if you're lucky, is, has called you back. That's not the way that God wants to evangelize through us. It may have been a way which was effective before, but this is what the Bible is saying here. He's saying that, the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you, okay? It says that when the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you, then Gentiles will come to your light. It says, and kings, kings to the brightness of your rising. Imagine us walking in such a degree of glory, such a degree of power, of wisdom, that Boris Johnson comes to us, he calls us, he somehow gets our number. He's like, brother, uh, brother, I've heard about the wonderful things you're doing. Do you want to come to the parliament and advise us? You know, how we can deal with COVID-19. Imagine that happening. You know, imagine, <laughs> imagine the chancellor saying to one of us, oh, I heard you're, you're a wonderful prophet. We want to find out what's going on in the economy. Do you know what the Lord is saying regarding the next six and 12 months? But this is what, the, it sounds far-fetched, but this is what the Bible says. It's, when we read about Joseph, that's what that, you know, effectively Joseph was, right? That's effectively what Daniel was. He, he, he had such a high level of glory, a high level of character and integrity as well. Because the world is not only looking for talent. I think the world is looking, there's enough talent in the world. The world is also looking for people with integrity, looking for people with character. Because you can be so talented, but you could be, you could lack 
trustworthiness. You could be a backstabber despite that talent. So the world is actually looking. And when I say the world, I'm even talking about unbelievers. They're looking for people with integrity. And this is what, this is what, let me see what, let me see this. Definitely, I've always known this is one of the ways when God is glorified through us. Amen. Amen. It's definitely through character. It's through character. It says, lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far. So this scripture is saying that people will come looking for you. You know, as if, as if any of us have been called to evangelism, we've done evangelism in the past. We feel that we have to call them. We have to try and harass them. Come to Christ, come to Christ, come to Christ, come to Christ. People are running away. They're like, what's Christ? Which Christ are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> you can't even iron your shirt and you're telling me about Christ. <laughs> you know, people, people are confused. They're like, you're talking about Christ, but you're, you're, you're late to work 30 minutes like every day. You're talking about Christ. It's those type of little things. You know, I don't want to be harsh on any one of us, but th these are the things that I'm mindful of. These are the experiences that I've had where I've said, okay, I've talked about Christ and now I've made this mistake and now I look stupid because I've spoken to, to, to these people about Christ and now I'm not reflecting Christ. It may not even necessarily be my character, but it might be something small as the things I said before, where they say I'm not looking the part. Let's say I'm looking disheveled. Let's say I've arrived to work late. That doesn't bring glory to Christ. And yet I'm telling them, come to Bible study, come to Christ. But this passage is saying that no, people will look at you and come to you and say, no, I want to hear about Christ. Who is this Christ that you serve? Let me give my life to Christ. Because ever since I've seen you and you talk about your Christ, you've been prospering. Your face glows. You're kind to everybody. You're favorable. You're always calm. You're always peaceful. This is, this, is, this is without me saying, this is without us doing miracles. This is us, without us casting out devils. This is without us raising the dead, the, without healing people from sicknesses, things that we can all do anyway. We can all do that. If we, if we laid our hands on people, we could do it with the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm sure all of us here have seen these manifestations, certainly in other people's lives as well. So we can do all of the, the, these things. This is on the basis of the glory of the Lord, which is revealed through our integrity which is revealed through our character, through our kindness, through our, through our diligence, working hard, through our humility. Somebody at work tells you off, and not a bad way, but to, you know, tries to advise you, and you're humble. You don't argue back. You're like, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I've heard. I want to put that, put that into practice. Those are the things that really separate us from the world. It's the character. Howbeit sometimes it seems, as I said, that some people who don't have Christ seem to have a better character than people that supposedly do know Christ. That's the remarkable thing, that we're in such a horrible predicament in the church, in this, this modern church, that you see a lot of uh, leaders are prioritizing miracles. Their whole ministry is based on casting out devils. The whole ministry is based on healing. The whole ministry is based on miracles, on tongues, speaking in tongues and prophecy. Those are secondary things. The first thing is character. The first thing is being like Christ. How be it Christ said, many of you will come to me in that day saying, I have cast out devil in your name, Lord. I've, I've raised the dead in your name, Lord. I've, you know, I've done crusades and spoken to thousands of people and I've done miracles wherever I've gone. And Christ will say, depart from me. You work of iniquity. A work of iniquity is somebody that has a bad character. Okay, a work of iniquity is somebody that thinks it's fine. Oh my gosh, I think someone's trying to, if you just bear with me two seconds. Sorry, two seconds, please. Amen. Yeah, so, um, we see there that God is not prioritizing the miracles. God is not prioritizing the signs. The, sign, the Bible says these signs will follow those that believe. So we shouldn't be looking for signs. We should be looking for character. We should be looking for how can I become kinder? How can I become more patient? How can I become more loving in my life? How can I give to people around me? 
it's not only money that I must give, there's other things I can give. I can give people my time. I can give people my ears, listening to people when they're going through difficult times. There's a lot we can give to people around us. Now, the, the second scripture, and this is just to add to what somebody's just written, definitely, I've always known this is one of the ways, so I was talking about integrity, where God is glorified for us. Let's see what, what Jesus said. There's a couple of verses that Jesus gave about integrity. Greetings, sister. Um, we're just talking about, um, we're talking about integrity. Uh, we're talking about character. Uh, we're talking about glorifying the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Good evening. Um, so come with me to, to John chapter 15. John 15 verses. Let's read verses 8. It says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So he says, this is the way in which God is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Okay, I think we looked at this last week or two weeks ago. We saw what does fruit mean? What is fruit in reference to? Fruit is in reference primarily to our character. The fruit of the spirit. Fruit, according to God's word, is in reference to our character. To our character. And then look what it says in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, praise God. In John 17, it says, uh, verses, bear with me. Let's read from verses, from verses 21. It says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So the world believes in Christ when there's unity amongst the saints, when there's love, there's fruit amongst the saints. That is why Satan strives to bring division in every aspect of our lives. He, he strives to bring division in the family. He strives to bring division amongst friends. He strives to, to bring division amongst the church to the extent that we have different denominations. Some say that they're, they're Catholics. Some say that they're Protestants. Others say that they're Pentecostals. Others, they're Anglicans. When we're called to be Christians, none of these terms are mentioned in the Bible. Protestant, Pentecostal, Apostolic, Reformed. Presbyterian, none of these terms are mentioned in the scripture. The only thing that we hear is, is the, being a Christian. Because Satan has brought division because Christ said that if they are one in love, the world will know that I am Lord. Then the world will know that you, Father, has sent me. So glory, glory, glory is what God is looking for. But glory, glory is what's going to bring people to the body of Christ. Glory is what is what is what's going to cause sinners to come to jesus christ yes yeah, yes yeah, it's john john chapter 15 verses 8 and then john 17 verses it was verses 21 thank you Amen. so glory is what brings people to christ Gl glory that is upon our heads glory that is in our lives okay People don't come to Christ because we beg them to come to Christ. People come to Christ because they look at us and they recognize that by the way that we live our lives, that there is an, actually an advantage to come to Christ. People do not decide to choose something unless that there's, a, there's a mutual benefit for themselves. So people do not come to Christ unless they recognize that there must be a benefit in joining Christ. And we are the people that show them. We are the salesmen or the saleswomen that show the world, not by our words, but by our lives, that coming to Christ is much better than not having Christ. And that is why the most effective evangelists in, you know, in the world are the people that demonstrate Christ to the best of their ability. And people have done it differently throughout the scriptures. Solomon did it differently than Jonah. Jonah did it 
by shouting and, and crying and screaming on the streets and saying, come, come and repent, come and repent. Solomon did it by his wealth. Solomon did it by his wisdom. Solomon didn't go and beg people to believe in his God. People came to him and begged him that they, that, that, that they can turn to his God. The Bible says the kings of the whole world came to Solomon to hear his wisdom. So there's different ways of evangelism. Paul, the way Paul evangelized and brought people to Christ was different. Paul did it through miracles and signs and, and, and his loyalty and his zeal and his passion and his wisdom and his eloquence and his intelligence. That's how many people came to Christ through the life of Paul. Through the life of Christ, through his compassion, through his love, through his insistence on truth, through his fearlessness in the face of hypocrites and religious zealots who did everything in their power to destroy him, Christ bring, brought many into the truth, many into the faith, through his courage, his boldness, and of course, through his miracles and his signs. So there's many different ways we can bring uh, people to Christ. But the, you know what unites all of these people that I spoke about is, is their character, is their integrity. It's their integrity. It doesn't mean that you can't have flaws. We all have flaws. But the point of character is that in, by walking in the Holy Spirit, God takes those flaws out of us. Let me, show, let me share a scripture with you. Psalm chapter 65, I think it is. It's all about grace. It's all about, and when I, when I say it's all about grace, I mean in terms of developing this character. It's God that gives you this character. It's not something that, that we do by our own strength. It's something that God does inside of us. Psalm chapter, um, is it 64? Yes, yeah, Psalm 65, verses 3. It says, Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will purge them away. Amen. This is our prayer to God every single day. God, purge away my sins. Purge away my iniquities. I can't do it by myself. Lord, take away that anger. Take away that jealousy. Cleanse it away from me. Verse 4. Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach unto you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, even of thy holy temple. So David is saying here that God chooses us and causes us to come to Bible study. God chooses us and causes us to pray. God chooses us and causes us to think about him. It's not something that we do. It's actually the fact that God has chosen us and God has put his thoughts and has, God has put his heart into us. The prophet Ezekiel would say that God would make a new covenant with his people where he would put his spirit into us, where he would take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. So the reason why we think about him, the reason why we want to do good is because God has chosen us. Do you know, if God does not choose us, we will not think about God. If God does not choose us, we'll be living in darkness, we'll be living in sin. Do you know, the Bible says that when God doesn't choose somebody, he hardens their heart. He intentionally makes them wicked. The Bible says he turns them away and he, he, he makes them have a reprobate mind. The Bible says he pours a spirit of slumber upon them so that they can't see. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. God does that to them because he's not chosen them. He's rejected them. That's, that's the, that, that is the unfortunate truth about this matter that God chooses certain people. And the fact that we are all desirous to be good people, we all want to develop our character, I'm saying is a very, very good indicator that God has chosen us. Because the fact that we want to be good, that is a very, that is a very rare thing on this earth. What do most people want on this earth? Most people want to appease their flesh, pleasure, seeking after pleasure. I think Paul said it in the latter days that men will be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God, dishonoring their parents, backbiters, lovers of, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What is that power that Paul is talking about? Denying the power thereof. 
the power to transform your character. It's not the power to cast out devils. It's the power that God has given us to, to become better people. God has given us power to become better people. Paul said that there, there is no temptation that is uncommon to man, but with every temptation, God gives us the power to escape that temptation. God gives us the grace to say, no, I'm not doing that tonight. I want to, my flesh wants me to do it, but I'm saying no, and I'm going to rely on the Holy Spirit to give me the power to, to abide, to endure. So this revelation is that God has chosen us. And I, I was sharing this earlier on that the wonderful thing about God is that God chose us whilst we were yet young. God chose us whilst we were yet in our mother's womb. So if, if we know that God has chosen us, we need to trust in him. And we need to, we need to abide in his word. Whenever we fall short, we confess our sin. The Bible says, confess your sin. He is just and faithful to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that cleansing process, that sanctification, that purging, that transformation of our character comes from our acknowledgement of when we are in, in the wrong and through us confessing it before people, before God, I'm not saying before everybody, but before you, the Bible says you can confess your faults to one another so that you may be healed and forgiven. So there might be somebody you can confess to. Or it might be that you feel you want to confess directly to God. But in, you need to be somebody that's reflective. You need to be somebody that tries to look at yourself from an impartial position. Because so often we look at life and we look at ourselves from a, from a tainted, uh, I don't know what the, the phrase is, you know, from the is it rose-tainted uh, you know, perspective. And this is, this is pride. Because if we look at ourselves and we don't think there's anything wrong, then that's likely to be pride. But sometimes we have to look at ourselves from the perspective of other people. We need to look at ourselves from the perspective of other men, from, from God himself as well. And in doing so, we're going we're gonna to see, oh, there's impatience, oh, there's this, there's that. And that is the first step towards that, that God being able to transform that character. But if you're always in denial, Let's say your mom comes up to you and says, oh, like, you, you know, I found out that you're like this, you're like that. And you're denying what your mom is saying. You're denying what your friends are saying. You're denying what your boss is saying. Then there's, there's not going to be any room for you to grow. You'll be stagnant. In fact, I don't even know if there's much thing as, as st being stagnant in this world. You're either going up or you're going down. <laughs> Throw an apple. The apple's either going up or it's going down. The, ap the apple's not going to be stagnant in the middle of the air. I don't see anything stagnant, to be honest. Even the plants or the trees that appear not to be stagnant, they're still growing. Some of them are decomposing. They're always in the, in, in the flux of motion. And that is the same with us with regards to character. Our character is always either getting better or it's getting worse. It's getting better or it's getting worse. And we have to be like, okay, I've been in the faith for five years. This is how I was in my first year. Am I getting better? Am I actually getting worse? And if I am getting worse, what can I do to actually get better now? Because this is getting worse. If I don't stop it, it's going to spiral and I'm going to get worse and worse every day. To the extent that I'll look at myself and, I'll, and start questioning, am I even a Christian? <laughs> I used to be a Christian. Now I'm swearing. Now I'm getting angry. Every little thing somebody says, I'm getting angry. I'm getting bothered by whatever somebody says. You have to have that impartiality with yourself. You have to be your strictest judge. It, should, it shouldn't be that somebody comes up to you and say, oh, Brother Mudipa, I found out, you know, I've been thinking I was a bit cautious to tell you, but, you know, I felt I have to tell you because you're my brother. And I found out that, you know, I think you're quite lazy. It shouldn't be a surprise and be like, oh, am I lazy? I should have known that I'm lazy before my brother tells me that I'm lazy. How do I know? By reflecting. How do I know? By, by, by crying out to God and saying, God, reveal to me my secret sin. Reveal to me all the things that are wrong inside of me. Help me with those secret sins. Amen. So let's go back to, we're going to close soon. Let's go to, back to uh, Genesis chapter 39 and look at um, Joseph. Okay, it says, verses four, it says, and Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer 
over his house and all that he had, and he put it into his hand. So character, character is the source of promotion, the source of promotion in God's kingdom and also the source of promotion in this world. When people discern that you are a person of character, people can entrust what they have to you. When Potiphar saw that Joseph was a man of integrity, a man of character, he said that he made him overseer over his house and all that he had, he put into his hand. So, so Joseph had possession over, uh, uh, over Potiphar's servants. He became an overseer over all the servants. Okay, Potiphar was, basic, was the general of Pharaoh, so he was a very rich man. He was, he was basically the, the head of the army for Pharaoh. So Joseph became the overseer of all the servants. Joseph had, it must have been uh, uh, power over his finances as well. As an overseer, he would have had a, a say in his finances as well. And this is the same thing that happens not only in this world, but happens with God. When God sees that you have integrity, God can give you wealth. He can give you money. When God sees that you have integrity, God can give you spiritual gifts. He can give you prophetic unction. He can give you, and when I say prophetic unction, I'm not talking about this, this, oh, God says in 2022, you're going to make thousands of pounds, you're going to make money. No, God says that if you sow 100 pounds today, you're going to make 1,000 pounds next month. Like, no, that's not prophecy. And that's not the prophecy of God. I'm talking about the, the, the way that these old prophets walked in. And the, I'm talking about even prophets in the Old Testament. They, they seem to be more prophets than some of these prophets that claim to be prophets in the New Testament. These people in the Old Testament saw things. Daniel saw things that were to take place in kingdoms and in nations. Abraham saw Christ thousands of years before Christ was born. The Bible says in John 8, I, think, I believe 56, it says that Abraham saw this day and was glad. So Abraham was a prophet who saw things. Christ, uh, no, David, the king, was a prophet. I think it says in Psalm 2, no, in um, uh, Acts chapter 2, it says that he was a prophet. In Psalm 110, he says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's David, he wrote that, that Psalm and he was prophesying about Jesus Christ. So David saw Christ, was about a thousand years. Yeah, a thousand years before he came. These are the prophets I'm talking about, prophets that can see things deep into the future, deep into the past as well, because Moses was a prophet and Moses wrote the book of Genesis. He was so prophetic that God showed him how he made man. Can you imagine? This is how prophetic Moses was, that he wrote the book of Genesis. He wrote about Adam. He wrote about Noah. He wrote about those things because God showed him those things. So when I'm saying that when we have character, we can have prophetic unction, we can have the ability to raise the dead. We can have the ability to heal all manner of, of cancers and sicknesses and epilepsy and all these type of things. God is willing to entrust these things to us. All it takes is his touch. What did the, the woman with the issue of blood, all it took her is one touch and her life was changed. All it takes is one touch from the heavenly father and our life can be changed. Our life can be improved. It takes one second. What happened, the apostles, disciples were in Jerusalem and then suddenly the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. It just takes one second. Suddenly God can invest and impart all the things that we need in one second. But what is he looking for? He's looking for character. As I said, character is built over a long period of time. So many people think, especially in this microwave generation, they think that they can get the, the deep things of God, the most Valuable things in creation come from God. And I think that they can get it just by going to one prayer, record, prayer retreat or going to uh, you know, a prayer vigil all night. No, no, no. It takes diligence and it takes prioritizing God for a long period of time. A long period of time. The Bible, I was reading earlier on about Enoch. It says Enoch was 65 and then he began to walk with the Lord. And now it says, after that, it says he walked with the Lord 300 years. And then he was taken. Then he was raptured. He was walking with God consistently for 300 years before God moved in his life. Look at Moses. Moses, well, you know, Moses thought that he was going to begin his ministry when he was 40. He went out and he was watching the Israelites because he, he knew that God had, had raised him to be a deliverer for the, for the Israelites. That's why he was there. 
And then he saw that they were treating the Israelites badly. So he went to one of those Egyptians and he killed him. And that was part of his plan to become what God had called him to be. But that wasn't God's, that wasn't God's timing. God still had to deal with him in the secret place. God had to deal with his character. So he was there in the wilderness for 40 more years. It was so long that I believe at this time, Moses had even forgotten that God had called him to be, to be a deliverer. Moses had began to doubt whether God had, had called him to be a deliverer. But at that time, he was sufficiently purged. It took him 40 years. Moses began his ministry at the age of 80. And he led the children of Israel for another 40 years. And even then, even in those 40 years, God was still dealing with him, with his character, dealing with him in the wilderness. So it's, it's a long process. We, we, we will not even be perfected even in this world. Even our bodies will, will, will need the resurrection before we, we, before we are perfected. But what, are, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the spirit. I'm talking about the soul. Because when we talk about character, character is an internal disposition. Character is an inner, an, it's an inner matter. It's not about your outward, outward man. Your outward man is a reflection of your inner man. What you do with your hands is a reflection of what is in your heart. So when God is dealing with character, God is dealing with the heart. That's why God said, if you lost after a woman, that's not your wife who has a husband. You've committed adultery in your heart. That's why he said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. That's why he said, cleanse the inner man. He said, he was talking to the, fact, to the, uh, to the Pharisees, he was rebuking them. He said that, you guys always focus on, the, uh, focus on the outward man. You always focus on tithing. And you think that by tithing, you're going to be justified in the sight of God. He said, why don't you first cleanse what is within you, and then the outward will also be clean. So that's why I'm saying character is something that we build by, by uh, reflecting on our thoughts, rejecting bad thoughts that come into our mind. That is, that is developing your character. Rejecting bad motives in your heart. Oh, I want to I wanna go and do this because of this is what's going to get me. This is what's in, in it for me. That is, you can reject that motive. You can de deride that and say, no, this is not what Christ would want me to do. I'm only doing what Christ would want me to do. That is building your character. Because as I said, when God sees that in your heart, then God will be like, okay, this is somebody I can deal with. Let me pour my Holy Spirit on him. Let me pour a deeper measure of the Holy Ghost upon him. So there's deeper level, as I said, anointing is what gives us power and gives us character, but a deeper dimension of the anointing. And what should happen in our lives is that the more we walk with God, the anointing should be stronger on our lives than what it was when we began. We're serious about developing this character. So, I'm going to close on one scripture and let our focus not be so much on miracles and power and all those things, but let us focus be on the character. Because as Christ has told us, he said, seek my kingdom, seek my righteousness first. When you seek righteousness, you seek that good character, that godly character, everything else will be added on to you. So let's look at the, before we close, let's look at what God is looking for when he chooses a man. Because as I said, we've all been chosen. We've all been chosen here. But let's look at what God is looking for when he chooses a man. Uh, Psalms chapter 78. In Psalm 78, verses 70 to 72. Psalm 78, from 70 to 72. Okay, amen. It says, he chose David. So God chose David, also his servant. And took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ooze great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. Okay, this is our, you know, anybody that's been called to be a king, anybody that's called to be a leader, as David was, is called to feed the sheep of God. Okay, that means to, to give them the word of God, to teach them about righteousness. Okay, when God raises up a leader, it's literally for this sole purpose to teach people about righteousness. Okay, this is what uh, Jesus said to, to Peter. He said, Do you love me, Peter? Peter, he said, Yeah, yeah I love you. He said, Feed my sheep. 
The Dulami, feed my sheep. He said it three times just to emphasize how important it is, feed the sheep. You know, of Abraham, when Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed, God was speaking to the angels and he said, can I hide this thing from Abraham, seeing that he shall be a mighty nation and he shall teach his whole household my, my ways. So when God was looking at Abraham, I was thinking, this man, I like him. He teaches his family. He teaches his wife. He teaches his children. He teaches his servants. He teaches all of them about me. This is what I like in an individual, somebody that teaches people around them about the ways of God. And this is why God chose David. It says, and then this is the key verse, verse 72. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So this is, this is wonderful, actually, because this verse is, is consolidating this notion that God is looking for two things in every Christian. The integrity of his heart, which is your character, and then guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. That is your talent. That is your power. That is a demonstration of, of God's power in your life. It might be singing. It might be teaching. It might be the prophetic. There's two things there that God looks for in every Christian. Integrity of heart and skillfulness of hands. Amen. So we're just going to close there with a prayer. Um, and again, thank you everybody again for who came tonight. Um, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We just, we bless you and we praise you for everything you're doing in our lives. Father, we know that only you deserve the glory. Father, you're the best, Lord, and we love you. We honor you. We pray, Lord, that even as we've spoken about tonight, Father, that you will develop our character. Father, God, if there's one thing that we desire, we pray that we'll be blameless before you. Father, none of us wants to miss out on your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you will continue to purge us and remove anything from our lives that's not pleasing you. Father, keep us in holiness all the days of our lives and use us for signs and wonders wherever we go. Father, continue to keep us in good health. Continue to increase us and prosper us. Father, as you were with Joseph and as you were with Christ, I pray that you will be with us that we will go around doing good and we will heal those who are oppressed by the devil in Jesus' mighty name. Father, grant us long life before you so that we can teach your people about your ways in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And Father, I just pray for a double, for a double portion, for more anointing upon your people, more grace, more signs, more miracles, more favor wherever they go. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Good night. 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 Good Good night. Good night. Good night.